government looking at it, and uh, they'll realize that something unusual is going on. If the government is not looking at it right now, you tell me? <clears throat> well, as far as I know, uh, not much of the government, let's say, is looking at it. Not nearly enough. Why is that, Tom? <clears throat> well, it's understandable. The things I'm talking about here, the scalar wave, for example, is not in the present scientific theory. Uh, at best, what I'm talking about would be regarded as highly controversial. Exactly. Now, if we can move it close enough to where we get it into the highly controversial area, where it's accepted but highly controversial, and by the way, we're doing some very strong things uh, to try to get it to that point. At that point, then, you'll find a lot of normal, orthodox scientific agencies will begin looking at it. The moment they do that, the moment we get the sharp young graduate students and the sharp professors in our major universities looking at this thing, at that moment we're going to make an awful lot of progress real fast. And that's what we've got to get happening. We've got to get them turned on to it. And we've got to get them doing the phenomenology experiments. There are thousands and thousands of phenomenology experiments that have to be done before we'll fully understand this area. How many Only a few of those have been done at the present time. How many transmitters do the Soviets have that are doing this, do you think? I wish I knew. If I had to estimate, you know, I'd estimate somewhere like a dozen. It but sounds I, to me that's like... purely a guesstimate. It could be many more than that, or it could even be fewer. They have to use an enormous amount of energy. Where are they getting it? Okay, there's two sources of the energy, of course. If you look at normal uh, sources, you could get it from a power plant. Uh, you could tie your local hydroelectric power plant or... Uh, the Soviets are pretty good at magnetohydrodynamics, and at least <clears throat> in some of their literature, they have shown uh, that they've had entire power plants run by magnetohydrodynamics that have been tied up to transmitters. For example, uh, in some of the translated Russian papers I was looking at, they have admitted transmitting uh, something like uh, 18 or 20,000 amperes uh, through the entire crust of the Earth. And so they're... We know that in that kind of transmission, they're using very, very powerful transmitters. Well, they use extremely powerful ones up around Riga. Those are the ELF transmitters. Yes. Now, the, the things that we've been calling the woodpecker signal, and the woodpecker name, as you know, Bill, comes from just the sound that the chirp signal makes when you detect it. It sounds nothing, like nothing more than a woodpecker's bill hitting a block of wood. And so it was promptly dubbed the woodpecker signal because of that rapid chirp, rapid drumming noise that it makes. Uh, those transmitters, I've seen various estimates on how powerful they are. Some of the estimates run up uh, as high as, uh, oh, 100 megawatts. Mm. Uh, some even estimate a little, little higher than that. But whatever they are, they're extremely powerful transmitters. The other thing is, the thing that we're detecting from them is only the normal component. Now, when you use a lot of power in something like that, there's an efficiency with which you would get scalar waves. In other words, you wouldn't get 100% pure scalar waves. You'd get a lot of noise, a lot of spillover, and the other stuff. Now, that part of it, I think, the uh, like it's like what's above the water we can detect, but what's below the water we can't see. The majority of the stuff that they're transmitting is below the water, so to speak. It's in the scalar range, and our normal detectors don't detect that. Now, since we're on this subject... And since I know that some people in the audience who are listening to me are technical folks, I want to say one other thing just for the technical folks, and I'll be very brief. I want to tell them how to build an extremely sensitive scalar wave detector. The way you do that is you use the very strongest magnet that can be made. You use a superconducting magnet. Make yourself a field that's 30 or 40,000 gauss. Understand a strong magnet is about 12,000 gauss, a very strong one. And I'm talking about making an extremely strong field. In that pole or in that field, you have a warp in space-time. And it's strong enough that a scalar wave, if you look at that as a longitudinal vector, to the space-time background, it appears to have a lateral component. What that all means is if you stick a normal wire in there and hook it up to a resonant circuit with an oscilloscope, you can detect the scalar wave as an ordinary Maxwellian electromagnetic wave. So you just put it in an extremely strong magnetic field, as strong one as you can make in the laboratory, stick a straight wire in there or a coil or any other kind of detector you want to stick, an ordinary detector, leave one end of it hanging open, 
tie the other end to a resonance circuit that feeds an oscilloscope, and you can look at all the scalar waves you want to see. So when you do that, you'll find that something like the woodpecker is very much more complicated than what you can find with a normal spectrum analyzer or with our normal detectors. In other words, they can put stuff down below the ocean in the common language I'm using here now, the stuff that our normal detectors don't see. They can put currents, they can put resonant signals, they can put patterns and multiple patterns. The interesting thing about those kind of patterns that you put in, in that way that we do not see with our normal detectors and we don't know are there, in the human body, there are highly nonlinear detectors that are very precise. Uh, up until about three or four years ago, the orthodox scientific view was that the only thing that electromagnetic waves really did to tissue was when they were strong enough to heat it. And if they heated the tissue and hurt it, then that was what damage they did. Simply how much energy was deposited in a cubic centimeter of flesh or something like that was the way they looked at it. Energy deposition. Today, through some very forward-looking scientists who pounded away and done the experiments until they found it and proved it, and it's now been accepted, we now know that a biological system has very, very sharp trigger frequencies in it. And uh, as well pointed out, lo, these many years ago, by my good friend Dr. Robert Beck out there in California, I think he's been fully vindicated in the fact that those triggers do exist and they are very precise. The literature now bears out everything Bob was saying quite some time ago. Well, I'd hope he'd get on the air with us, but he he's still shy. Okay, well, that's fine. I understand why. He's got good reason. Uh, but he's a capital fellow, and he, like I say, a lot of the things that he's been doing years ago, and that uh, a lot of people put a lot of pressure on him because he was doing that, uh, he's being fully vindicated at the present time. Now, the scalar wave, if there's a nonlinear part of the body that has one of those sharp biological triggers, let's say down in a cell, and it's quite nonlinear in there, when... In the scalar wave part of it, that is, that's below the ocean, the hidden part, if you have that exact frequency in there, and that's absorbed in the body, and you hit that sharp trigger, you get an effect far beyond the very minuscule amount of energy you might be putting into the body. And so, if you know about those biological triggers, and you know how to hit them, you can hit them from Riga and Gomel or wherever else you're putting the transmission of this kind of energy out. You can hit them in a U.S. target population. You can hit them in us, sitting here in North America. Are you saying then, with transmitters in the Soviet Union, they're able then to affect the bioenergetics of the human body? That is correct, and halfway around the world. I'm saying exactly that. And the scalar component of it, the normal, uh, you know, conducting shield, the normal, if, the normal Faraday shield will not work. It won't even slow the scalar wave down because the free electrons don't react to the scalar wave, it goes right through them. It'll only react to something that's nonlinear. Uh, you have to build a very nonlinear device to shield against that. You can shield against it, but you can't shield against it the way we normally do shielding. Mm -hmm. And so the normal kinds of shields that we have don't even slow it down. It goes directly on into the body and hits its target if they, in fact, put that frequency in there. And so <clears throat> that sort of thing can be done to the population or the target population over in, and you can do it real easy in the zone where you interfere the waves and you make them into normal energy waves there. You can add a component which will hit the weaker biological triggers that way. You just hit it with normal energy. Now, the interesting thing about this interference pattern, when you do the interference, the energy which rises that we're forming in the middle rises from the microscopic region. That is, it rises from points in space. It does not come through the space like you would think of a wave going through water. It's as if it arose at each point in the water. So anything in that region has electromagnetic energy forming in it at the smallest point in the atoms, in the nuclei, in the, if it's made of molecules, the material is, it's in the molecules. And so you can have very, very intense point heating occur, a point deposition of energy, in an object this way, with that effect for